Let's now discuss some of the accessory structures that's associated with the integumentary system. And that includes the hair follicles and the hair, nails, sebaceous glands, and pseudoriferous glands. And these integumentary associated structures are located in the dermis. Furthermore, they project through the skin surface, basically the cutaneous membrane. So the first accessory structures that we're going to look at is the hair follicle and hair. It turns out that the human body is covered almost entirely with hair. However, there are exceptions. For example, we don't find it in the palms of our hands, the sides of the fingers and toes, as well as the sides and the soles of our feet. Basically, thick skin. Now, we also don't find it in lips and as well as portions of the external genitalia. And of course, lips and portions of the external genitalia would be classified as being thin skin. So what's the function of hair? Well, it protects and insulates. It guards openings against particles and insects. So for example, our nose hair, that guards the opening leading into our nose, and as well as hair that lines our external auditory meatus, or basically our ear canal. So that prevents particles and insects from making its way deeper into our ear. It turns out that hair is extremely sensitive to very light touch and I'll explain why that is in a moment. So let's first begin with the hair follicle. The hair follicle is located deep in the dermis. It is responsible for producing non-living hair, something that we're gonna discuss later. Furthermore, it's wrapped in a dense fibrous connective tissue sheath that we refer to as the dermal root sheath. And you'll see that it is part of the hair follicle. Now, this dermal root sheath is surrounded by what's called the root hair plexus. This root hair plexus are sensory nerve endings. Please remember, these are nerve endings and not blood vessels. So this is what gives the sensitivity to hair. This is what makes it sensitive to light touch. So imagine when you wiggle your hair, you feel that. Why? It's because of this root hair plexus. If you pluck hair or pull the hair out, certainly that's not pleasant. It's painful. Why do you feel that? Well, it's because of this root hair plexus. Please remember, these are not blood vessels. So let's look at the structure of the hair follicle. What does it consist of? Well, one of the components is what's called the dermal root sheath, which again is made up of a dense fibrous connective tissue. This is the outermost layer of the hair follicle. In addition to the dermal root sheath, which consists of connective tissue, we have the epithelial root sheath. So I think this is a giveaway. The type of tissue that makes this root sheath is epithelial. Now, we can further break down the epithelial root sheath into the following. We have the external epithelial root sheath, which constitutes the middle layer of the hair follicle, and the internal epithelial root sheath, which is the innermost layer of the hair follicle. So what I've done to the left is broken down the hair follicle into the dermal root sheath and the epithelial root sheath. Don't forget, the dermal root sheath is connective tissue, while the epithelial root sheath is epithelial tissue. So let's look at this diagram to the right. So here is my hair follicle. And if you look carefully, here is the dermal root sheath, which again is dense fibrous connective tissue and followed by the epithelial root sheath, which again consists of the middle layer, the external epithelial root sheath, and the innermost layer of the hair follicle called the internal epithelial root sheath. So we'll discuss later how this essentially is what's going to produce non-living hair. Let's now talk about the hair. The hair consists of the following. We have the medulla, which is found in the innermost core of the hair. Then we have the cortex, which is the middle layer, followed by the cuticle, which is the outermost layer of the hair. So once again, I've made an illustration to the left where I've broken down the components of hair. The medulla, the innermost, the cortex, the middle layer, and the cuticle, the outermost part of the hair. Now, hair can either be what's called hair root or hair shaft. So what's the difference? Well, hair root is if the hair is still attached to the integument. 
So basically, this will be the lower part of the hair because once again, it's deeper. It's found attached to the integument. Now, if we look at the hair root, at the very base of it is what's called the hair bulb. And this is essentially an expansion or an expanded region found in the base of the hair root. So I'll point out the hair bulb once we look at what's called the hair shaft. So the hair shaft is the upper part of the hair. Basically, it's the part that is not attached to the integument. So this would be the part of the hair that we're, we comb. This would be the part of the hair that we cut if our hair grows too long, for example. So once again, the lower part of the hair is the hair root because it's attached to the integument, while the upper part of the hair is the hair shaft. Why is it the upper part? Because again, it's not attached to the integument. So let's look at some of these images that's included in this slide. So we'll begin with this right here. And so let's find the medulla. So here's the medulla. And I think everyone can see that clearly is the innermost core, followed by the middle layer, which is the cortex, and the outermost layer of the hair called the cuticle. Now, if we look at the hair follicle, as we discussed in the last slide, we have the epithelial root sheath and the dermal root sheath, which are parts of the hair follicle. Now, if we look at this image, once again, we have the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle components of the hair. Now, take note, we have the hair shaft, which is the part of the hair that's above the skin. In other words, it's no longer attached to the integument and the lower half of the hair, which is below the skin surface, essentially the hair root. And here, of course, is a hair follicle with its components. And at the base of the hair root, we have this expansion, which we refer to as the hair ball. So if we look at this image over here, here is that expansion of the hair root. Why is it called the hair root and not the hair shaft? Because once again, it is the lower part of the hair that is attached to the integument. And lastly, we have this image right here, and here it says follicular wall, but of course we're talking about the wall of the hair follicle and the dermal root sheath and the epithelial root sheath. Now, I intentionally did not discuss the glassy membrane, so I will not ask you as far as the glassy membrane being part of the hair follicle. Just know the dermal root sheath and the two parts of the epithelial root sheath. Of course, external epithelial root sheath and the internal epithelial root sheath. And here is the hair root, okay, with the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. Now, what I'll do is I'll use my blue highlighter and highlight the hair bulb. And so what we want to do is focus on the expanded part of the hair root. So this area that I'm highlighting, this is all that expanded base of the hair root, once again called the hair bump. The two accessory structures associated with the hair is the erector pilite muscle, which is smooth muscle and causes the hair to stand up, which produces goosebumps. So let's look for this erector pilite muscle, this smooth muscle, which is again one of the accessory structures of the hair. So when this contracts, when we get scared or when we are cold, this will cause the hair to move in this direction. And by doing that, it creates this sort of fold-like appearance on our skin. Basically, the goosebumps that we see when we're frightened or when we get cold. Another accessory structure associated with the hair are the sebaceous glands. Basically, oil-producing glands and the oil is referred to as sebum. So if we turn to our image once again, here is the sebaceous gland, and this produces sebum, which will help lubricate the hair and our skin. It also can control certain bacterial growth. So let's now talk about how non-living hair is produced. This occurs in this expanded region that we find at the base of the hair root called the hair bulb. So it is at this hair bulb where we have hair growth. Now within the bulb, we have a structure called the hair papilla. And the hair papilla is a mound-shaped structure that projects into the hair bulb. 
and it contains capillaries. So let's talk about this hair papilla and these capillaries that we find in the hair papilla. So once again, the mound-shaped structure, which I'll highlight in blue, is called the hair papilla that projects into the hair bulb. And it is in this hair papilla that we find capillaries, basically blood vessels. We refer to these blood vessels as the hair capillary plexus. So this hair capillary plexus is critical if the hair is to continue to grow. So this is the blood supply that nourishes the hair follicle. Now keep in mind, the cutaneous plexus that we talked about earlier, a branch off of that is what's going to give us the hair capillary plexus. So once again, the cutaneous plexus, which is a network of blood vessels, will eventually give us the hair capillary plexus that we find within the hair papilla. Another structure that we find within the hair bulb is called the hair matrix. And this hair matrix will be a layer of dividing basal cells, basically the stratum base saline. So turning to the images that we have here, here is your matrix, and I'll highlight this area in blue. All right, so this is essentially where hair will grow. And if we turn to the bottom picture, here is the hair matrix. And I've made an illustration of all of this in the next slide, and I'll explain how this all works, how non-living hair is produced. All right, now, as far as the hair growth cycle is concerned, we have what's called growing hair, which essentially means that we have actively dividing cells, epithelial cells, the stratum base saline that we find in the hair matrix. Now, at some point, cell division will stop, and that follicle is going to be referred to as an inactive follicle, not a dead follicle, an inactive one. Basically, the hair is not growing because the cells are not dividing. When that occurs, the hair is referred to as club hair, and eventually division begins again at the hair matrix, and now the follicle becomes active once again. So we basically say it's just a new hair growth cycle. We'll look at a slide where we're going to see the three cycles of the hair growth cycle. The next thing I want to discuss are the types of hair. So we have what's called vellus hair. Vellus hair is your soft, fine, peach fuzz hair that practically covers our entire body, with the exception, of course, of areas where we find thick skin and our lips and external genitalia. Everywhere else, we're covered with hair, and it's mostly this fine peach fuzz hair called vellus hair. Now, there's another type of hair called terminal hair, which is not soft and fine. It's the opposite. It tends to be thicker. It tends to be heavy and as well as highly pigmented. So we find this, for example, in the hair that grows on our head, our scalp hair, our eyebrows, and our eyelashes. Now, at some point, some of this vellus hair, this fine peach fuzz hair, can transition to becoming terminal hair. And this occurs during the onset of puberty. And what causes vellus hair to transition to terminal hair is because of testosterone. So when testosterone levels begin to rise upon the onset of puberty, certain areas of the body where what was once vellus becomes terminal. So for example, the facial hair. So for males, that vellus hair that's found in the face which eventually will lead to the growth of a beard. We also find it in the axillary region, the armpits, basically. So the vellus hair in the armpits will transition to terminal hair upon the onset of puberty when testosterone levels, once again, increases. Other areas of the body include the pubic region, as well as the arms and the legs. Now, because males produce more testosterone than females, then clearly there will be more terminal hair in males than females. Now, there is another type of hair that I'd like to discuss that I wrote on the left side, and this is referred to as lanugo hair. This is fine, very soft hair that covers the body of the fetus, and basically this will protect the fetus from the amniotic fluid while it's developing in the womb. 
and sometimes the lanugo can be seen in newborns. Eventually, this will fall out and will be replaced with vellus hair. Now, as far as hair coloration is concerned, this is produced by the melanocytes at the hair matrix. So we talked about the two major pigments that's associated with skin coloration, the pheomelanin and the eumelanin. So someone who produces more of the lighter shade of melanin called pheomelanin, then they tend to have a lighter hair color, the blondes or the light browns, for example. Now, if you have more of the eumelanin, the darker form of melanin, then the darker your hair coloration will be. So the dark browns and the black hair, for example. Now, note, hair coloration is genetic. So your genes basically will determine the type of hair color that is produced. And if you have gray hair, incidentally, what happens there is the melanocytes will slow down melanin production. So essentially the hair becomes gray to white when no pigment is produced, which is seen as the aging process occurs. So let's now diagram how hair grows.